jump into today's message. Um, if you're new with us, it'd be helpful for you to know that we practice a form of preaching called expository preaching. What that means is we sim- simply is that we believe the Bible's best taught by going through a book of the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and really looking at what God was speaking to the people at the time, but not only that, what he's speaking to us today. So we've been in a really long section of Matthew called the Sermon on the Mount. There's so much goodness in the Sermon on the Mount. And, and I'm going to tell you, I get a lot of times people go like, man, pastor, you threw so much stuff out, out there. I didn't catch it all. You're not going to. Okay. Like the goal is that the Holy Spirit would prompt something in the, in, in the sermon to catch your heart and grab a hold of you and speak to you. But the cool thing is, um, with the help of, of, of my lovely uh, assistant, Lacey Turner, who, who, um, who comes in here and, and edits the video every week and puts it on podcasts, is you can go back and listen to every sermon we've preached for the last three, four years on YouTube or Facebook or any podcasting site, and you can go back and go like, man, what did he say there? I want to, and, and listen to it again. And sometimes that's good. The goal with doing this book of Matthew is that you guys would go home and study it for yourself. I do not expect you to take everything I say and be like, oh, well, man, now I know it. No. We have our, the Bible for ourselves so that we can go home and we can study it and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. So there's going to be things that you pick up today, and there's going to be things that you don't. But the goal of it is that, that you pick up something and you hear something, and it also helps when you're like Steve over here and you got your notes ready. I'm like, Ray, I'm, he's, he's taking notes. Okay, so we're going to jump back into chapter 7 today. Um, last week we covered verses 1 through 5, which was do not judge so that you won't be judged. For you will be judged in the same standard in which you judge others. And you'll be measured by the same measure you use. Why do you look at the splinter in your brother's eye, but don't notice a beam of wood in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the splinter out of your eye, and look, there's a beam of wood in your eye. Hypocrite. Another word here, I love this as I saw it this week as I, as I went back through this. It says, imposter. Imposter. First take the beam of wood out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. How close can you get to somebody when you got a log hanging out your face? And you don't even recognize it. Hey, you got a problem. Yeah, well, you just smacked me four times with your log. Okay? Every time you get near me, your log just whacks me. Okay? How can we even have a conversation? So don't be an imposter, all right? Last week, I got really passionate in second service. Okay? Those who stayed for second service, they know. I got really passionate, okay? And, um, and I want, I, and I had several people reach out to me and say, hey, were you targeting me, targeting me directly? And, and while I would like to say I did not intentionally target anyone specifically, and I didn't. I did not target anybody specifically. However, um, it would be hard, I struggle to say that, like, no, there were several in the room last Sunday that had made judgments against their fellow Christians. And I got passionate about it, okay? Uh, being a pastor's hard. Can I be real? I, I, I've always been real with you guys. Nine years, I've just been real with you guys. It's hard being a pastor, okay? Because people come to me, and they feel this sense of freedom to say whatever they want to without ever thinking of the fact that, you know, he's human too. He gets offended too. He takes things hard too. I mean, I, I'm not Jesus, y'all. Um, I'm not. I, I, I don't have that ability. And there's sometimes I get fired up about things. And, 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 and like I got to sit there and like just swallow stuff and swallow stuff. Um, so I get judgmental too. I struggle with it. I've struggled with it my entire walk with God. Um, and, and as I began to think about this this week and study it more, I wanted to go back here because I really believe that where we're going today also like, rides in this whole area of ju- this judgmental idea. Um, I wanted to study it more and go more into it because I have a struggle. I mean, I sit there and I think back at the, the things I get frustrated at Christians about in our church, um, fellow members of the church about, are the same things I did when I was a lay minister in Perryton. I can remember there's a guy named Philly Landeros. I love Philly. Philly was, uh, at one time, uh, had the opportunity, he probably would have been a pro baseball player had he not got in a drunken bar fight and had 
a beer bottle smashed into his face and lost his sight in his right eye. The dude could pitch. I mean, he's in the Texas High School Hall of Fame for, um, for, for scoreless innings and all this stuff that he, he did. But Philly had been a part of our church since he was in high school, and, uh, and he just struggled with alcohol. Um, and I think he's gotten free from that now. Uh, he's an amazing man of God. But like, they had left the church for a while, and then they came back. And like two weeks or three weeks in, our children's pastor decided, because Philly and his wife were really good at doing kids' ministry, he wanted to invite him to come back and be a part of kids' ministry. He was accepting Philly, where Philly was at, and giving him opportunity, like saying, hey, you're welcome back. I got so angry that an alcohol, like we would let someone who struggled with alcohol teach my children. And I was like a full-on jerk in the pastor's office when the pastor said, hey, Terry, you're just going to have to trust me that, that, I'm making, that we're making the right decision here. I don't trust you. Look at who you're putting in charge of my, like, helping with my kids. And I look back at that now, and these things like pop up where it's like, oh, man, I was the judgmental person. That I, that, that I got so passionate about last week. See, the Bible is full of calls to judge. I mean, honestly, there's, there's a ton of them. Um, what Jesus is specifically speaking about is the idea of personal judgments. When I begin to become the, ju- the, 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 the judge and have my personal judgments and, 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 and go into like this, like, like I'm pushing my judgments of what's righteous and what's not righteous. Who's righteous, who's not righteous? Who's, who's saved, who's not saved? Who's, who's good enough, who's not good enough? When I begin to do those things, it's, 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 it, like, that's where I get in trouble. See, the problem with personal judgments is they become religiocentric beliefs that take hold of our identity. That's a big word, religiocentric. I learned it this week. Okay, it's 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 this idea that when I begin to believe my religious views are greater than someone else's religious views. Okay, and that begins to take hold in my identity. It takes hold of who I am. And what happens when things take hold in our identity? It begins to like every time something comes against that identity, that identity is no longer a biblical thing. It's a thing where like, like I got to protect my identity. I mean, you see it throughout, like, this is where our world has gone, like, crazy gone in the last few years. It used to be where we could have conversations. I mean, I, you could sit down with, like, if you were a Republican, you could sit down with a de- Democrat, and you could, you could have a conversation about politics and stuff and viewpoints and that kind of stuff. But now, uh-uh, I only have Facebook friends that are exactly like me. And, if, and I see it all the time, people are like, if you don't believe what I believe, unfriend me right now. Anybody seen those, those, like, those, those views? Like, here's what I believe. If you don't believe that, then just unfriend me. Because I don't need anybody in my life that disagrees with me on viewpoints. That becomes our identity. And it becomes, the, like, that takes hold. And it makes us, like, it, it gets, makes us these egotistical, e- egotistical people. Uh, as, I, as I've talked to Rabbi Feldman, several times he's brought up that in the 70s, some of you guys that were Christians back in the 70s, you guys can attest to this. I wasn't alive then, so I don't know. But he said oftentimes in the 70s, like, one of the things that they always said was, um, Jesus saves us from our identity crisis. Okay, that was their thing. Well, Jesus saves us from our identity crisis. Well, that morphed into, like, now I have this identity. I, I, I get saved, and now I get a new identity in Christ. And the closer I get, to, the longer I've been walking with God, the more my identity becomes my identity. And my identity begins based off of my favorite songs. Like, like what I remember as, as the greatest movements of God. So, my, man, my songs, you got to have my songs. And, and that, that, that version of the Bible that I began reading, and, and like, you, like you can't deviate from that. That's my identity. And, and like we begin to take things that are not of, not some, that, that, that are more philosophy tr- or, or theology or, or, stu- or ideas, and like we begin to mold it into, real, in, into, into this religious view of things. See, and, and we begin to, to create what, what's called the negative other, okay? Our identity really isn't based off of, uh, uh, off of, of um, things we are. It's more based on things we're not. You ever thought about it that way? Things we're not. So we have a negative other that keeps us at, at our area of life because I look at that and oh, I'm not that. 
well, I'm not that, and I'm not that, so I'm this. So Rabbi Feldman shares this and everything, and, and, and he says when he grew up, him and his family moved out to, a, to Long Island in New York. They had moved from, from the Bronx to Long Island into this village that was, was predominantly Jew, uh, uh, um, and, and, and it was middle class and everything, and, and that identity was like, like, we're all this, like, we're all better. He says, and in that time, he says, it was the 50s, okay? So in that viewpoint, like, no, the, the black people lived over here. We live over here. And as long as they're not here, our identity is safe and secure in who we are. And he says, and if a black person were to have moved into our neighborhood, we either had to kill ourselves or kill them. Because it was messing up our identity. Because the truth is, middle class, uh, we, we need the poor. We need those that are less. We need the negative other in order to feel good about our identity. Are you following me? And we do that in Christianity. We do that with our, our, our walk with God. We begin to create negative others, judgments of others, of I don't do that, so I'm better than them. Instead of looking at our own stuff and allowing God to work in it. Where am I at, God? Where's my walk with you? What about my secret sin? Because it's easy to see people's open sin and go like, man, they, they, they're so messed up. And God's like, but then that's why Jesus flips it. Like, like, let's look at it like this, so like adultery. Like, it's easy for me to look at somebody who's committed adultery and judge them. Be like, man, I cannot believe they were unfaithful to their wife. All the while, while I look at, at some movie star actress or whatever and lust over her and, 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 and have thoughts of her that are impure, and huh, but she just say, if you've done it in your heart, Jesus flips the script because Jesus came in to destroy the negative other. He put us all on the same level playing ground. And that's what he's doing in the Sermon on Mount. He's putting us all on the same level playing ground. You're all sinners. We are all fall short. But this is what a kingdom believer, a kingdom follower looks like. So we get, um, we, get, we get caught up in this stuff and we got to be careful that we're, we're not getting into these roles of being uh, religio-centric or, or that my identity is something other than what Jesus is creating me to be. See, I can't love others if I'm only thinking about or protecting myself or my ideas. If every time I get into a conversation with someone who has a different idea than I do, and it becomes about, i got to die on this hill. I'm not loving them. I'm not. And, and I see in my head all the time, um, there's like a riot, and there's this lady with short hair and glasses, and she's like screaming and has her finger pointed and everything. I, I, I see that all the time in my own self. Like, this is, I'm, I'm dying on this hill. I'm di- is it, but is this a hill worth dying on? See, the only way judgments can be done properly is if they're done judicially. That's the only way a judgment can be written. Uh, like, innocent until proven guilty. You deserve your day in court. You deserve to be judged by a jury of your peers. Like, like that's, that's what, like, the American, but we don't live that way. In, like, we, honestly, we don't live that way at all in the United States anymore. No, <laughs> you're judged just because you're judged. Like, like, yeah, you may get to have your day in court, but I've already made up my idea about you. Help me out, Mike. What's the Jewish word for when, like, speaking ill of someone else? Lashon hara. Lashon hara. Rabbi Feldman was explaining this to me this week. Lashon hara. This idea, like, within Judaism, like, the worst sin you could possibly commit is to destroy someone else's reputation. It is to say something about somebody that would, 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 would cause someone else to think wrongly about them. Even if it's able to be proven that you're wrong. Like, it's like, it's like in their eyes, it's unforgivable to destroy someone's reputation. But he says it goes even deeper than that. He says you're not even supposed to talk good about somebody when they're not present. He says you're not. You're not supposed to talk about people, period, when they're not present. Because even in talking good about him, like for me to say, like, you know, Mike, he's the greatest guy ever. Mike uh, like helps me with all this different stuff, and he does all the, uh, you know, did, did all this stuff. Like by saying that when he's not around, that gives you opportunities. Like, yeah, but have you seen how Mike acts when he's playing softball? 
Okay, it gives an opportunity for, for someone to like, oh, we're talking about Mike, let's talk about Mike. Okay? So this idea within Judaism is like, you don't speak about people behind their back. You don't talk about them. We don't talk about, and, and I honestly think, man, that's a lost art. Because I get caught in it every day. I'll be in the office talking about some, somebody and, and everything and like something, conversation and whatnot. Um, besides something that's healthy or, 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 or praying for somebody or that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden, identity sets in and judgment sets in. And I'm out of control. So i got to protect myself. See, judicial judgment finds its authority in the Word of God. i got to go to the Word of God if I'm going to... Like, judgment comes that way. And that's why every judgment in the Bible comes from that direction when he says to judge a leader or a person uh, to judge their character before you put them in leadership that's judicial judgment what am i weighing them against the word of god and one that we, we used to, i learned this this week i didn't realize this okay another scripture that we constantly and i don't have it up there because i forgot to put it in there is found in second thessalonians i think it's second thessalonians where it says avoid the appearance of evil we use that all the time avoid the very appearance of evil you know how hard that is to live that out because we make judgments on that. It's like, oh, that looked evil. Oh, you know, we, we do that all the time. But you know, if you go and you, and, you, and you read that scripture in its entirety, it's talking about prophecy and judging prophecy and saying that you need to be careful when you're prophesying in the church, that, that, you, that, that your prophecies are from God and that what you're prophesying is from God and to avoid the appearance of evil in your prophecy. It's not about living daily life stuff. But man, do we as Christians use that one all the time. It's like, avoid the appearance of evil. I saw you walking into that convenience store that sells beer. Well, all I did was buy a Coke. Well, it appears evil because they sell beer there. Maybe someone might think that you're going in there to buy beer. I've heard this like my entire life. I've seen all, like, like, all these things. Like, don't go. Like, I've talked to people that like were, um, were, uh, what grew up in the 70s and, and, and 60s as Christians and everything, and not, not being allowed to go roller skating because they had couple skates. And that might appear evil. My best friend, Mikey, who's a, now a Methodist student union leader, lost his papers or was asked to turn in his assembly got papers because his student ministry had what they call the hoedown every year. It's their biggest fundraiser of the year where they square dance and line dance and like do these things and like tons of people come in and like one of the the leaders of the west texas district called him up and said we don't dance in the assemblies of god like okay he's like we don't do what people do horizontally vertically he's like you can square dance in a bed i've never I, i've never i've never you can line dance in a bed what we don't rub belt buckles in the ag that was what was said to him and this was like i'm guys i'm telling you this was like 20 years ago we make all these judgments and like avoid the appearance of evil and everything but we don't really align it with the word of god and do it judicially because we make personal judgments and and and, and frankly the symbols of god lost one of the greatest student ministers of our time to the methodists because of it and since then, he's moved on to the new Methodist thing. So he's not like, he's not, he, he left the United Methodists and has joined this other thing. But we lost one because of unfair ju judgments. See, and, and, and when we judge judicially, when we get into the word judicially, here's the deal. None of the gospel writers will ever contradict Jesus. So if you're reading something that a gospel writer wrote, and you're reading it from the vantage point that it contradicts something that Jesus did or said or how Jesus acted, you're interpreting it wrong. Okay? You're interpreting it wrong. So let's move on to the next verse in this. Because I'm going to run out of time real quick and i got a lot left to say. Um, you give me a month off, guys, I'm going to come back swinging. Don't give what is holy to dogs or toss your pearls before pigs, or they will trample them under their feet and tear you to pieces. There the Texan came out, pieces, okay? Um, this has been one of the most difficult scriptures I have ever studied, y'all. Like, this week was, like, daunting. 
because I opened five different commentaries, including a sermon by a very, very astute pastor, and every single one of them had a different view on what the scripture means. Every single one. And, and, like, I'm sitting there going, like, holy cow, how am I going to preach this scripture and, and, and bring justice to it, you know? But one thing they all agree on is this does not speak to this idea, and I've heard it. So, like, like some of you are going to be like, what? Christians don't say that. Yes, they do, okay? It does not speak to this idea of, don't, uh, uh, of not bringing what what um what is holy to those who are going to reject it immediately like, this idea of, like don't withholding the gospel from certain people groups because you know they're going to reject it that is not speaking to that because how do you know they're going to reject it unless you unless you bring it to them right how, how do i know someone's going to reject the gospel unless i'm willing to bring it before them and everybody agreed on that all five of them they're like no no, no this is not what this means and, so, and certain Christians, like, this becomes the viewpoint. It's like, like religiocentric. Like, man, I, like, they're this, so I'm not sharing it with them because they're going to reject it. I don't cast what is holy before swine or before dogs. I don't bring my pearls before, before that. Like, no, it, a, that actually contradicts the gospel. Matthew 28, 19, 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Teach them to deserve everything I commanded of you, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. So if Jesus, before he tells you to go into all the world, says, hey, don't cast it before people that are going to reject it, doesn't make much, that kind of contradicts him, right? And it, and it only contradicts the way that Jesus tells his disciples to handle rejection in the book of Luke. Luke 9, 5 says, if they do not welcome you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet, as a testimony against them. Doesn't say don't go into the town. Doesn't say reject them completely. It says, hey, when you walk out, they reject you. Dust it off. Okay, I'm, I'm good. Off my feet. I'm done. I did what I was called to do. So, so now that we've cleared that up, okay, this isn't an excuse not to share the gospel with somebody. Let's look at what these five different guys had to say. Okay? Herbert Basser, in his commentary, Herbert Basser was a Jew who did not convert to, to Christianity, okay? But he's one of the leading scholars on, on the study of Matthew. And he studies it from just, like, the fact that, like, this is one of the greatest literary works ever. So he, stu he, he studied Jesus. So he's coming at it from a, 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 a non-Christian point of view, like, like not accepting Jesus. And, and, and believe it or not, it's okay to... To, to, to study that stuff and see what the outside, outside, what's outside of us, how it looks at it. But he took it back to Proverbs 11.22. This is a rabbinical, uh, a rabbinical teaching, okay? A beautiful woman who rejects good sense is like a gold ring in a pig's snout. It's useless. Man, she's pretty, but she's dumb. See, he disagrees with the translation of the Arabic word quadashin as holy things. So his disagreement, he's like, hey, they, get, they, they, they miss, when, and when they translate the English, they miss this, uh, or even the Greek. It doesn't mean holy things. What quadashin means is, is, is gold rings. Better translate it gold rings. So he said, basically what he says it should be interpreted as is uh, don't cast gold rings your gold rings before a dog and don't cast your pearl before swines. You know, which is fine, but that's where he goes with it. So his interpretation involved this, this idea of not casting wisdom to a believer who can't accept good sense. Boy, do I get this one. Where people will call me and ask me for advice on a situation going on in their life. Pastor, I just don't know what to do. I'm thinking about doing this, and I and and and, and because I just got I got to confront this issue and I got to deal with this issue and everything. And what do you think? And I'm like, I don't think you should do that. I don't think it's going to go well. I think it's going to actually backfire in your face. And then 30 minutes later, I hear they did exactly what I told them not to do. And so I'm like sitting there, like, yeah, I've casted some pearls and some gold rings before some dogs and swine in the church who won't listen to me and do exactly what I say 
uh, do exactly the opposite of what I say to do. So I can see Herbert Bassler's point here. Don't, don't, cast, don't cast your stuff before like someone you know. Like every time I try to share it with them because they're going through so much junk in their life and they like come to me and they want, want me to talk, like they want to talk about their junk with me. Like every time I tell them what to, what to do and they, like, they, like, they go and do the exact opposite. They just keep doing it. Like, hey, I'm dating a guy who, who, who isn't saved and, and who, who doesn't agree with me spiritually and doesn't have any of the same beliefs. And I, and I like, should, should I stay in that relationship? No, probably not. Like, the Bible says not to be unequally yoked. I mean, that means you're pulling the load with someone that doesn't agree with you. What, what's going to happen when you're pulling the load? You're going to go in two different directions. What they do, they marry that person. And then they wonder why things are so tough because they're unequally yoked. And I'm sitting there going like, man, I just cast pearl before swine again. Here we go. The next guy was Dr. Arnold Fruchenbaum. Dr. Arnold Fruchenbaum is a Messianic Jew. Um, great guy, great teacher. I like his teaching. He has completely gone away from Judaism in his own walk with God as, as a, a Messianic Jew. And so a lot of his interpretation is, is, is that from, an, like, like he left Judaism um, so he sees it as this, as Jesus basically telling the disciples not to expect the, ex, the Pharisees to expect, uh, accept these truths. Don't expect the Pharisees to get it. They so stuck in their beliefs and their religiosity and their religiocentric ideas, they're not going to get it. That's what he, he said. So this is a jab at the overly religious. And I see that as a pastor. And I can attest to that. It's like, man, they just ain't going to get it. They're never going to come along. I can remember fighting as a worship pastor, fighting the worship wars. If you've ever been a worship pastor, you don't, you, oh. And as a young Christian, just battling with this. And I can remember in Perryton, sitting with the board one time, and this guy, the, the, um, as I, right after I became their worship leader, and this older guy in the church in his 80s, he goes, Pastor, Pastor Terry, um, I, don't get me wrong, I don't even like it when the Gaithers sing new music. I hate this. And then I began to realize he was losing his hearing. So when we sang the old songs that he grew up in, it was take, he was being actually taken back to a place where God moved so powerfully in his life. And it wasn't so much about the song, but it was about the remembrance of God's move during that time in his life. And I had those same things going on in my life. You know, I, guys, I hear draw me close to you now. I'm taken back to youth group in 1998 the power of God sweeping over my life. So I'm like, man, we should sing Draw Me Close to You every Sunday. No. Because God's moving in new ways now. And that's why I said in my prayer this morning, it's not about me. I'm not worshiping me. It's not about the song. It's about God. And I can worship Him to hymns. I can worship Him to, to 70s worship. I can worship Him to the old camp tunes. I can worship Him to the new stuff. Now, there are times when I'm like, when I get, to, I got to be careful that I'm not overly judging a song and trying to, to beat it up. Yes, I do. But I, Jesus, so his, his point of view is that, um, that um, disciples, uh, like, like we, we, we got to be careful that, that um, like, you know, the religious, the overly religious, they're just not going to catch the truth. And then, I, I've listened to this twice now, thanks, um, thanks to Tony. I listened to it a while back, and then I listened to it again this week. In a beautiful and well-thought-out message by Stephen uh, Armstrong, he likens casting pearls before swine and holy things before dogs to extending morality to pagans without first sharing the gospel of salvation with them. This idea of, like, if I could just get people to start acting morally, they'll be better. It'll make their life better. So, and he uses the idea of, like, like, you got a neighbor, and he's living with his girlfriend. He's not married. To her and everything they're living cohabit they got all these problems and you go and tell them like man if you guys just got married life would be better life would be like like it would all go it all be better because your morality is so messed up that's what's messing up your life he says without telling them hey if you don't know jesus your life's gonna be hell jesus came to save you from the fear of death he, his salvation without it's like it's sharing morality without sharing the gospel and and, and and salvation 
So to cast what is holy before someone who's going to trample it, and, like they don't, like they, they can't grab morality unless they, and they can't accept the pearl unless they first accept Jesus, the wisdom. Okay, and I like I can see that too. I'm like sitting there going, man. And then I I, I read read um uh, Rabbi Barney could. Uh, Kasdan, who again went to Proverbs eleven twenty, a beautiful woman who rejects good sense is like a gold ring um, in a pig's snout. Um, so he says this in his in his concordance. In a, another strikingly humorous statement, Jesus uh, or Yeshua notes that we are not to throw our pearls to pigs. The vision of the of this unkosher animal sporting a valuable, valuable necklace would surely stir up some laughs in the crowd. However, in the spiritual realm, the metaphor becomes quite serious. The saint pigs will not only trample the jewelry under their feet, but will also then turn and attack you. The lesson is clear. Those who have no discernment about the distinction between the holy and the profane will have no appreciation for the spiritual riches of Yeshua. In fact, some will become downright antagonistic. If a person is so turned off by the treasures of the new covenant, then it's better not to confront them further. There, sorry, there are many people, even in our day, who are seeking and, and hungry for what Yeshua offers. Our time is better spent on those who want to dialogue in a respectful manner. So his viewpoint is don't get in foolish arguments with people who are not going to accept what you have to say or not even hear you out. And I see that point too. So which is it? What's the right interpretation? And I struggled with this all week, y'all. I'm like sitting there going like, man. And finally on Thursday, I called Rabbi Feldman up. And I'm like, hey man, I've been studying this all week. I was trying to do it without him, y'all. I was like, man, I'm not going to ask Rabbi Feldman for any advice on this. I'm going to get it all my own, all through my own reading. And he's listening to the sermon probably right now. I'm like, I'm going to do it. I, I got this. I got this. I, I, he's giving me the books. He, I, it's like, like, I tried to give him back a bunch of his books at, at the beginning of my sabbatical. And he's like, no, 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 no. You need to keep this one. You need to keep this one and this one. And I'm like, I think I only gave him back two of the 25 books that he gave me. Okay? So I got all these concordances on my desk that I'm reading and, and going through and everything. It's like, like, I got this. He gave me enough books. I can do this on my own. So I can finally call him like, man, I've gotten five different translations on this, and I'm really struggling with it. And he goes, okay, well, why don't we talk later, later on today? I'm like, cool. And about 20 minutes later, he sends me an article written by a guy named Colby Martin. Now, Colby Martin, I don't know anything about him, but evidently he's a post-evangelical pastor. I don't know what that means really e e either, but, but, but he, says, so don't, he says, don't get too much into this guy's theology. But he says, I think he's on point here. And the first thing that he says in his article is this. One of the rookie mistakes I made in my early preaching days was to assume that each passage of the Bible has one and only one meaning. He likened the word of God to a diamond. Now, there are certain scriptures that have only one meaning, okay? That we can take literally and we know it's literally, and this is literally what it means. But you look at so many of the Proverbs, and the Psalms, and, and, and Jesus' parables, and the things, even the disciples at times, as Jesus was talking to them, go like looking at each other like, hey John, what did he mean by that? I don't even know what he's saying. I don't know either. And then I imagine later on, Lacey, just hold up, you don't need, need to come up. Um, um, like lately he's like he's like man what, what, no, later, imagine later on like oh that's what he meant but the thing about it when we begin to look at at a diamond at first glance on the surface level the diamond's beautiful like and, and we see the surface level stuff and like oh yeah i can grab that i can grab that but as i study the word and i turn the diamond i see other aspects of it that like oh wow that right there, that's beautiful. And, oh man, I never caught that from that scripture again before. And then I flip it and like, oh wow, there's so much more. Like when we begin to look at the word of God outside of our identity, inside his identity, when I begin to look at the word and I reread things and I look at things and I go through things, I can see so many 
different avenues in which God is speaking to me through that scripture. I take the parable of the, uh, uh, of the, 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 the son that falls away. For so long, man, it's like, man, I get it. Man, I've been the kid that took my, my inheritance and went and ate and they ended up in the pig slot thing. But then I've also been the big brother that got angry at his father because he accepted his brother back. And I've also been the father at times that I look at my kids and I go, man, they are so lost. I would do anything, God, for them to catch on to this and to understand this and grab a hold of what I'm trying to teach them. See, and as I look at this scripture, don't cast your pearls before swine, I can see so many different things. And then this guy brought up something that like, that really flipped the script on me, okay? And this is like, I, like I'm running a little, little long, but I got a few minutes, okay? Um, um, he, 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 he talked about Buddha. And I'm like, oh, I'm done. This, guy's talk, this guy brought up Buddha. But one of Buddha's teachings was that things are only precious if we make them precious. Things only have value if someone deems them valuable. So he flips the script on this. He says, you know, a pearl starts out as an irritation in, 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 a, uh, in, in an oyster's mouth or a mussel's mouth. It's an irritation, and as a... As a, a, a um, a, a, a coping mechanism or a way of doing it, it begins to form something over it and then it rolls around in the mouth and it creates a pearl. Pearls are pretty. Gold is nothing but dirt. It's an, ore, it's, it's an ore in the ground that we have to dig up and someone decides to dig it up and says, oh man, it's pretty, so we're going to make it valuable. So the pearl and the, in, in, in the gold is, is only beautiful to the person who chooses to put value on it, Right? And what we learn in Revelations is the streets are made of gold in heaven and the, and, and the gates are made of pearls. So, um, so to God, gold is nothing more than paving material. What we find most precious. And sometimes what I consider a pearl might be nothing but, might not be that, that, that pretty to somebody else. So an idea that I have or something I grab, and this really spoke to me as a pastor because there's been moments over the last four or five months as I've been going through the spiritual journey that I'm going through where people like are like totally rejecting what I'm saying or seeing, or, and I'm like, man, why am I even doing this? Why am I battling this? Why, why do, like every time I share something, somebody's got to come at me about it and attack me and tell me I'm wrong because I, 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 I shook them up a little bit. And, like, and then I'll give you a realize, well, maybe sometimes my pearl is an irritation to you. And when I'm viewing you as the swine, I'm judging. I'm, I'm, like, if you look at this in the, in the whole contrast of what, what Jesus is saying here, do, judge, let's not you be judged. This is piggybacked in this. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Sometimes my ideas, the things that, I, that are so valuable to me, are not valuable to you at all. You can be so excited about something. I'm not into it or I have a problem with it. And then all of a sudden, I'm the swine or I'm the dog that you just cast it before. So, so maybe, maybe what Jesus is saying here is like, hey, quit getting so offended when someone doesn't accept what you find valuable. Because we do. We do. Oh, man, do we. If I have an idea and you don't agree with my idea, you don't speak my language and everything, man, you are a dog. You are a pig. So there's so many things, so many facets as we, as we study the Word of God. Have an open mind to letting the Holy Spirit speak to you. See, the problem with identity is it leads to judgment. And the judgment comes out of this idea of I've got to protect this at all costs. You don't agree with it? You don't, you, you're just not grabbing what I got. You, you, you're a jerk. You're a terrible friend because, you know, like, I just don't like that. I'm not into that. I don't, I don't, want, I don't want to be a part of that. No, it's the greatest thing ever. Like Chiefs fans. You don't think the Chiefs are the greatest team ever? No. Well, you like the stupid Cowboys. Yeah, that's my team, okay? Like, it doesn't mean that I'm a, I'm a dog or a swine because I don't like your Chiefs. 
man, I think this guy's the greatest political mind of ever and everything. Like, oh, I think he's a jerk. You pig. No, I don't get to make those judgments. My identity is in Christ. That's who I identify with. See, do you want to know if you're judgmental? You don't know how you know? Ask yourself this question. Am I getting offended right now? Am I really uncomfortable with everything Pastor Terry had to say today? I'm probably in that camp of like, don't talk about judgment. We don't want to hear this as Christians. Pastor, could you just preach a message about how everybody needs to get saved? Yeah, you do need to get saved. Not, not in the salvation sense of needing Jesus. Some of you do. Some of you need to make a decision to follow Christ. But some of you need to allow Jesus to save you from the identity that you're holding so tightly to that he can't break through into. So I'm going to leave you today with a statement and a question. Here's the statement. This rocked me to my core this week. This came from Rabbi Feldman. I don't know where he got it, but I know he probably got it from somewhere because he, he reads a lot. The statement is this. The number one characteristic of a disciple is a desire to be corrected by the one who is doing the discipling. I come to be discipled before Jesus so that he can correct me and put me in the right path. Number one, character of a disciple. Oh, no, 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 don't you say that, Pastor. Mm -mm. That doesn't fit in our Western theology, does it? To be corrected? No. I only want to be surrounded by people that agree with me. All my friends on Facebook agree with me on everything. No. And then here's the question. How are we going to continue to let Jesus redefine and establish our identity in contradiction to what we believe our identity is? How are you going to let Jesus in to recreate, to correct your identity or reestablish it, redefine it in contradiction into what you believe it is? I'm this, then I find out I'm not. I'm this until I'm not. See, I, I struggle right now with, with, with putting myself in, into a place of identifying as a certain type of Christian. I know I'm not a Calvinist. I know I'm not an Arminius. I, some would think I might be a Molinist. I kind of agree with that stuff. I'm not, and then I look at the fact I'm assembly of God, but man, I really ad agree with a lot of what the Eastern Orthodox Church has to say, but I also agree with these Anglicans over here and what they say about it, and then, man, there's sometimes I grab a Methodist, uh, a, 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 something from a Methodist, and I'm like, man, Methodists, they, like, some of the Methodists, not, not, okay, some of the Methodists have some really good ideas, and then I look at some Baptist teaching, and I'm like, man, he really has it together on the Word of God. That's powerful stuff, and then I'm like, well, what, 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 what am I supposed to grab a hold of? What am I? I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm not anything but a follower of Jesus. And if I want the one who is discipling me, Jesus Christ, to be the discipler and to re-identify my identity, I got to lay my identity down. And I got to get into it for myself. I gotta get into myself. Would you stand with me this morning? Father, I praise you and I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your word. And how it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Able to cut to my marrow. Able to instruct me in wisdom and correction. God, I just pray that I would quit taking your word. And weaponizing it. 
so that I can put myself in a place where my identity is at a higher point than someone else's identity. God, I pray that we would take as a church, would take this, this principle of judge not lest you be judged. And we'd lay down the hammer and, 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 and lay down the fork and knife and quit eating our Christian brothers and sisters, bones and all. We would learn to walk with each other and have relationship with one another, even when we don't agree. And God, I thank you that through five different views of what the, your scripture means today, every single one of them had a truth that I can identify with you. And God, I just pray that every person that leaves here today would leave having grabbed a hold of something that, you, that the Holy Spirit would want to speak to them today. For that person who has not yet made the decision to walk with God, there's not a system of rituals or a system of things that we have to do. Your word says simply believe and follow. So I pray that every person in here today would have made that decision to make you Lord of their life, allow you to be the judge, and, and, and begin to allow you, follow you and allow you to disciple them. Relationship with you is easy, God. You, you, you said my burden is easy, my, my yoke is light. Let us take that on. Let us walk in it and allow you to continue to reestablish our identity into the identity of who you are because you solve our identity problem. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, I love you guys. Have a great week.